Pentagon's printing budget. Live here on C-SPAN. The nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 1246, a bill to reduce the amounts otherwise authorized to be appropriated to the Department of Defense for printing and reproduction. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a 15-minute vote. The only vote of the day on a bill that would cut 10 percent from the Pentagon's printing budget. Meanwhile, uh, work continues off the House floor on an agreement to keep the federal government funded for the rest of the fiscal year. Current funding expires on Friday. Congressional Quarterly writes that House Speaker John Boehner said today that $33 billion in spending cuts would not be enough to satisfy Republicans, throwing cold water on earlier suggestions from Democrats that a final appropriations agreement would cut that amount. We spoke with a reporter following the negotiations. Laura McGann is the Congressional Bureau Chief at Politico. A little more than four days are left before the money for the federal government runs out. Any sign of an agreement on spending cuts? Uh, no. And in fact, uh, John Boehner just said today uh, that a spending cut target that Democrats have said he previously agreed to, he did not agree to that. So if anything, we see, um, I mean, from, from what we can see from the outside, things look worse than they did, did even before. You mentioned that amount from uh, that Speaker Boehner, uh, in regards to Speaker Boehner, $33 billion in spending cuts. A lot of talk last week about that, but that's not all that's being negotiated. What else is in the mix? Well, the Senate Democrats have already said they will not pass a bill that has uh, riders attached to, attached to the bill, so things that don't actually perhaps affect um, the deficit, so things like cuts to Planned Parenthood, cuts to EPA, they've said they don't want these things. Meanwhile, um, House Republicans are, are demanding that those be included. So while there's both a, there's a, a standoff already over um, how much to cut, there's also this sort of um, separate battle over whether or not to have ideological uh, riders attached to the bill. Who are some of the key players in, doing, in the negotiations? Uh, so right now, the key players are Harry Reid, the Senate Majority Leader in the Senate, uh, and John Boehner, uh, the Speaker of the House. Um, those are kind of the two uh, main parties. Um, there's also been sort of pressure being put on the White House by Senate Democrats who want to see uh, Barack Obama more involved. Um, he's deputized so far Joe Biden to be his sort of surrogate in negotiations. And Joe Biden has made some trips to the Hill uh, to do that for him. If the House is able to act on a bill this week, it doesn't leave much time for the Senate uh, to do the same. Uh, what would happen under that scenario to keep the government running? There isn't a whole lot of time, but the bill has to start with the House. So it, it, if the House does pass a bill that has already been agreed to uh, in the Senate, it, that, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, the question is whether they can get everything done by Friday, which is the deadline before the government runs out of money. What are the chances that the federal government will shut down? I mean, right now we don't have a clear picture of uh, a deal. Um, you know, we, we're from, from the outside it looks like a standoff. So uh, we have a few days until, um, you know, we hit the deadline. So. So it's hard to kind of put a, a percentage chance on it, but um, at the moment there, th we don't see, um, you know, a, a deal emerging today, for example. If the government shuts down, what would happen to functions such as like Social Security or defense? I mean, that, that is a debatable question. I mean, we can go back and we can look at the shutdowns in the 90s um, to kind of get some perspective on what would happen. You know, there were some delays um, in certain government spending, but then the, but, but the military, for example, still was paid. Um, but it, it, it would depend on how long the shutdown went on for. Um, um, so it, it's a difficult question to answer because we're not, we can't say for sure. Laura McGann of Politico, thank you. You're welcome.
In addition to federal funding for the rest of fiscal 2011, the House will also consider this week a bill repealing the FCC's net neutrality rules and another prohibiting the EPA from regulating greenhouse gas emissions. Congressional Quarterly reporting that Congressional Republicans and New York lawmakers from both parties welcomed Attorney General Holder's announcement today that five alleged conspirators implicated in the September 11th attacks will be prosecuted before military commissions rather than in federal court. The decision is a switch from the earlier plan to try the five alleged plotters in civilian court in New York City. We'll watch Attorney General Holder's announcement during this vote. In November of 2009, I announced that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and four other individuals would stand trial in federal court for their roles in the terrorist attacks on our country on September the 11th of 2001. As I said then, the decision between federal courts and military commissions was not an easy one to make. I began my review of this case with an open mind and with just one goal to look at the facts, to look at the law, and to choose the venue where we could achieve swift and sure justice most effectively for the victims of those horrendous attacks and their family members. After consulting with prosecutors from both the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense, and after thoroughly studying the case, it became clear to me that the best venue for prosecution was in federal court. Let me be clear, I stand by that decision today. As the indictment unsealed today reveals, we were prepared to bring a powerful case against Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and his four co-conspirators. One of the most well-researched and documented cases I have ever seen in my decades of experience as a prosecutor. We had carefully evaluated the evidence and concluded that we could prove the defendant's guilt while adhering to the bedrock traditions and values of our laws. We had consulted extensively with the intelligence community and developed detailed plans for handling classified evidence. Had this case proceeded in Manhattan or in an alternative venue in the United States, as I seriously explored in the last year, I am confident that our justice system could have performed with the same distinction that has been its hallmark for over 200 years. Now, unfortunately, since I made that decision, members of Congress have intervened and imposed restrictions blocking the administration from bringing any Guantanamo detainees to trial in the United States, regardless of the venue. As the President has said, those unwise and unwarranted restrictions undermine our counterterrorism efforts and could harm our national security. Decisions about who, where, and how to prosecute have always been and must remain the responsibility of the executive branch. Members of Congress simply do not have access to the evidence and other information necessary to make prosecution judgments. Yet, they have taken one of the nation's most tested counterterrorism tools off the table and tied our hands in a way that could have serious ramifications we will continue to seek to repeal those restrictions. But we also must face a simple truth. Those restrictions are unlikely to be repealed in the immediate future. And we simply cannot allow a trial to be delayed any longer for the victims of the 9-11 attacks or for their family members who have waited for nearly a decade for justice. I have talked to these family members on many occasions over the last two years. Like many Americans, they differ on where the 9-11 conspirators should be prosecuted, but there is one thing on which they all agree. We must bring the conspirators to justice. So today, I am referring the cases of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Walid Mohammed bin Atash, Ramzi bin Al-Sheib, Ali Abdul Aziz Ali, and Mustafa Ahmed Hawasawi to the Department of Defense to proceed in military commissions. Furthermore, I have directed prosecutors to move to dismiss the indictment that was handed down under seal in the Southern District of New York in December of 2009, and a judge has granted that motion. 
Prosecutors from both the Department of Defense and Justice have been working together since the beginning of this matter, and I have full faith and confidence in the military commission system to appropriately handle this case as it proceeds. The Department of Justice will continue to offer all the support necessary as this critically important matter moves forward. The administration worked with Congress to substantially reform the military commissions in 2009, and I believe that they can deliver fair trials and just verdicts. For the victims of these heinous attacks and for their families, that justice is long overdue, and it must not be delayed any longer. Since I made the decision to prosecute the alleged 9-11 conspirators, the effectiveness of our federal courts and the thousands of prosecutors, judges, law enforcement officers, and defense attorneys who work in them have been subjected to a number of unfair and often unfounded criticisms. Too many people, many of whom should know better, many of whom certainly do know better, have expressed doubts about our time-honored and time-tested system of justice. That's not only misguided, it is simply wrong. The fact is, federal courts have proven to be an unparalleled instrument for bringing terrorists to justice. Our courts have convicted hundreds of terrorists since September the 11th, and our prisons today, our prisons today, safely and securely hold hundreds, many of them serving long sentences. There is no other tool that has demonstrated the ability to both incapacitate terrorists and collect intelligence from them over such a diverse range of circumstances as our traditional justice system. Let me be clear, and let me be very clear. Our national security demands that we continue to prosecute terrorists in federal courts, and we will do so. Our heritage, our values, and our legacy to future generations also demands that we have full faith and confidence in a court system that has distinguished this nation throughout its history. Finally, I want to thank the prosecutors from the Southern District of New York and the Eastern District of Virginia who have spent countless hours working to bring this case to trial. They are some of the most dedicated and patriotic Americans I have ever encountered, and our nation is safer because of the work that they do every day. They have honored their country through their efforts on this case, and I thank them for it. I am proud of each and every one of them. Sadly, this case has been marked by needless, needless controversy since the beginning. But despite all the arguments and debate that it has engendered, the prosecution of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and his co-conspirators should never have been about settling ideological arguments or scoring political points. At the end of our indictment appear the names of 2,976 people who were killed in the attacks on that deadly September day nearly 10 years ago. Innocent Americans and citizens of foreign countries alike who were murdered by ruthless terrorists intent on crippling our nation and attacking the values that we hold dear. This case has always been about delivering justice for those victims and for their surviving loved ones. It is about nothing else. It is my sincere hope that through the actions that we take today, we will finally be able to deliver the justice that they have so long deserved. Thank you. Right, I, um, if I could have two, um, uh, two questions. Um, the, the, what you describe as the blocks on Congress, uh, which just passed at the end of last year, yet there was a whole year um, when that indictment was handed up to the grand jury. So why not move faster? And second question, in February you ran into some 9-11 families on Capitol Hill and you told them, in your opinion, that going to military commissions was rolling the dice. Now today you've said that going to military commissions you have complete faith in the process. So has there been a change in your thinking? Well, I've made clear back in November and I made clear today that in terms of what I think the best venue for these cases, I, th I continue to think the Article III courts are the best place to bring them. With regard to the amount of time that it took, to remember that in 2009 we in, were in the process of reforming, we reformed the military commissions. There was uh, local concerns expressed about the bringing of the cases in Manhattan. We had to deal with that. And then Congress started to deal with uh, these restrictions that they put in place. We tried to fight them. 
uh, we have made this decision as quickly as we could, taking into account all of the factors. And as I indicated, I considered the possibility of bringing this case in a place other than Manhattan, but within the Southern District of New York. Um, <coughs> is it your understanding that bringing these cases in, uh, in uh, military commissions allows for, for seeking the death penalty? Uh, that's one of the concerns that's what that was raised previously about bringing these cases in. Uh, I think the death penalty can certainly be sought. It's an open question about whether or not somebody can plead guilty in a military commission and still receive the death penalty. That, I think, is still an open question. This decision due to the administration's plan to close Guantanamo, if these military commissions are held at Guantanamo, won't that mean that the facility is going to have to stay open for, for many months, if not years, to come to handle well, the trial? We will fight to get those restrictions lifted. Um, it I think it will necessarily have an impact on our ability to close Guantanamo. We'll probably extend the time. It is still our intention to close Guantanamo. It is still our intention to uh, lift those restrictions. Okay, these commission trials will take? Uh, I don't know. I'd refer those to the Department of Defense, which I think will be issuing a statement um, sometime later this afternoon. Mr. Holder, can you, uh, y you've been pretty clear on how you feel about the congressional actions here, but uh, presumably most of those lawmakers represent uh, constituents who have their own views. Is it your thinking that you know best and that there is just no room for the public's view on where a trial should be held? No, I don't want to hold myself out as, you know, omniscient or anything like that. The reality is, though, I know this case in a way that members of Congress do not. I've looked at the files. I've spoken to the prosecutors. I know the tactical concerns that have to go into this decision. So do I know better than them? Yes. I respect their ability to disagree, but I think they should respect the fact that this is an executive branch function, a unique executive branch function. I have to deal with the situation as I find it, and I have reluctantly made the determination that these cases should be brought uh, in a military commission. And the public, uh, uh, such as the groups in New York City that uh, came to oppose the trial there, should they have any voice at all in such a decision? Uh, we took into account a whole variety of things in trying to make a determination as to where these cases could be brought, and was one of the reasons why I considered the possibility of bringing it in Otisville, um, prison, which is in the Southern District of New York, but is in upstate New York, would not have come up with any of the concerns that people had about bringing a case in Manhattan, would have lowered the costs um, pretty dramatically. But even that option was taken off of the table by, uh, by Congress. Look, I grew up in New York City, you know? I grew up in Queens. I went to school in Manhattan for high school, for college, for law school. It is still a place I consider home. I had full confidence in the ability of the people of New York, the authorities in New York, to try this case safely and securely in New York City. If I didn't have that faith, I would not have made that initial determination. It is still my view that that case could have been tried in Manhattan. Based on what you just said about the death penalty, you said it's an open question. Does that mean there's a very real chance that they could serve life in prison as opposed to getting the death penalty, which you'd probably have a better chance of that in the Eastern District of, of Virginia? Uh, again, I'll, I'll defer that to uh, the folks at the Department of Defense who will be responsible for these cases. It is an open question, but it is one that could be resolved, and we'll have to see how it plays out. Ten years of that sounds like 10 more years of litigation all the way back up to the Supreme Court, maybe 20 years after the anniversary. This could still be um, litigated. Well, I have confidence in the ability of the folks in the military commissions and on the military side to... Uh, bring this case, these cases um, before the appropriate authorities within a relatively short period of time and to resolve them ultimately. And what I hope I have done today is to hasten the uh, date by which victims and uh, the families of victims will have uh, some certainty. Thank you. We'll hear Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell responding to the Attorney General in a minute. First, some of our live coverage tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning at 10.30 Eastern, House Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan holds a news conference to unveil his party's proposed budget for next year. That's fiscal 2012. Then at 12.15 p.m. Eastern, the memorial service for Washington Post reporter David Broder. And at 2 in the afternoon, the House Armed Services Committee peers from General Carter Hamm, who heads the military's Africa Command. You can see those events live tomorrow on C-SPAN 3. 
Now, here's Senator McConnell about trying alleged 9-11 plotters in military courts. Mr. President, the Republican leader. Amidst all the other business we'll be facing this week, I'd like to note a welcome development in the war on terror. For the last two years, the Obama administration has actively sought to bring the 9-11 plotters into our communities for civilian trials, a completely horrible idea that rightly drew overwhelming bipartisan opposition from the American people and from their elected representatives here in Congress. Today, the administration is announcing that it has changed course. The administration, incredibly enough, today is announcing it has changed course. And that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and the others who plotted these horrible attacks. <clears throat> Today, the administration is announcing that it has changed course, and that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and the others who plotted these horrible attacks will be tried in military commissions at Guantanamo Bay, rather than in a civilian trial in New York or some other U.S. city. Uh, Mr. President, I remember all of our discussions on this issue over the last two years. President issued an executive order on day one to close uh, Guantanamo down, indicated they were going to mainstream these terrorists into the U.S. court system. So this change today is truly a welcome development. The administration is announcing that KSM and the others who plotted these crimes will be tried in the proper jurisdiction, these military commissions, at the proper place for these commission trials, Guantanamo Bay. This is the right outcome to the long and spirited this vote, debate. The A's are 393, the nays are zero. Military commissions being in the at Guantanamo, the rules far from the U.S. The mainland, is passed, were always the right idea. To reconsider is laid upon, upon the table. table. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? I ask for unanimous consent to be removed as a co-sponsor from H.R. 1323. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. The House will be in order. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from North Carolina rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I send to the desk a privilege report from the Committee on Rules for filing under the rule. The clerk will report the title. Report to accompany House Resolution 200. Resolution providing for consideration of the joint resolution, House Joint Resolution 37, disapproving the rules submitted by the Federal Communications Commission with respect to regulating the Internet and broadband industry practices. Referred to the House calendar and ordered printed. The House will be in order. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Without objection, so ordered. The gentleman's Mr. Speaker, I rise to convey to the House the extremely sad news that our former colleague from New Jersey, John Adler, passed away earlier today. Congressman Adler recently underwent emergency heart surgery at the University of Pennsylvania's hospital in an attempt to resolve a staph infection. House will be in order. The gentleman may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. John Adler was 51. In Congress, John served with distinction on both the Financial Services and the Veterans Affairs Committee. As a New Jersey State Senator for 17 years, John served as Chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee 
and sponsored laws requiring pension forfeitures and mandatory prison for corrupt officials and to require smoke-free places. He also sponsored legislation to address environmental and health issues. John Adler, Mr. Speaker, had a razor-sharp wit, tenacity, and an extraordinary sense of humor and a great big smile, and we will miss him. I, along with my colleagues, extend our deepest condolences to Shelley, his wife, and their four sons. Where is he? Oh, for what purpose did the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Without objection, so ordered. One minute. Mr. Speaker, I, I can't believe that John Adler's life was cut so short. Uh, I really want to uh, reach out to, to Shelley's his children and his friends. Our, our heartfelt condolences go out to the entire Adler family. John was a friend. My wife was a friend with his wife, and my daughter was a friend of one of his sons. Um, it is amazing to me that he was able to accomplish so much uh, in the short time that, was he, that he was here. Uh, he grew up in real adversity. He's really kind of a, a person, uh, I, I wouldn't say rags to riches, but I would say someone who had a very hard life growing up um, and at a young age was very successful, went to Harvard undergraduate, Harvard Law School, became a successful attorney, and then uh, became a member of the State Senate for many years and chairman of the State Senate Judiciary Committee before he was elected to Congress. But beyond that, he also had a great sense of humor. I think many of us uh, know many times we were on the floor and you'd go up and ask him about something, he would tell you a joke uh, or, make, uh, or make fun of something. And, and I think that was another aspect of him that I can certainly uh, never forget. Um, he decided uh, at a young age that he was going to make a life in government. He could have done so many things, made a lot of money, uh, but instead decided to devote his life to, to politics. Uh, and my heart goes out to him. I want to remember him as an admirable example uh, for so many of us. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What, for what purpose did the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Gentleman's recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise, this, I rise this evening to express my sincere condolences to the family and friends of former Congressman John Adler. My deepest sympathies go out to those that knew him best and loved him most, his wife Shelley and their four sons, Jeffrey, Alex, Andrew, and Oliver. Congressman Adler was a committed and compassionate public servant who fought tirelessly for the causes in which he believed. His legacy of public service includes elected office as council member in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, his tenure in the New Jersey State Senate, and rep representing New Jersey's third congressional district, here in the United States House of Representatives. Mr. Speaker, words often fail to accurately reflect the true measure of one's life. But I hope that Shelley, their sons, extended family and friends may take comfort in John's many accomplishments and knowing that his lifetime of public service to, has left a lasting legacy for which they can be most proud. I yield back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what purpose did the gentleman from New Jersey rise? I ask to address the House for one minute to revise my remarks. Without objection, recognize for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I too rise in shock and sympathy uh, at the loss, the death of John Adler. Send my sympathy and condolences to Shelley and the family. Uh, I won't recount his many accomplishments or paint a full picture of John Adler, a truly wonderful public servant. I hope there will be occasion for a testimonial and memorial uh, here uh, at another time. But I do want to express to his many friends and many admirers uh, the sympathy and condolences. John Adler was dedicated to the service of the people of New Jersey. And you will hear again and again, if you didn't know John, about his wonderful cheerfulness and humor, 
that he showed in good times and in bad. A good friend to many of us, a friend to the people of New Jersey, a real loss. I yield back my time. Back my time. From the purchase of the gentleman from New Jersey Rise. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. I am shocked and saddened to learn of the passing of John Adler at age 51. John was a friend of mine for 20 years. We served together in the New Jersey State Senate for seven years, sitting next to each other, divided only by the center aisle. When we arrived in Washington in 2009, John and I were the only freshman members of Congress from New Jersey. Uh, we worked together on many issues here and served together on the Financial Services Committee. I believe John Adler worked for the best interest of New Jersey and more recently for the entire nation. My wife Heidi and I are friends with the Adler family, including John's beloved wife Shelley and their four sons, Jeffrey, now at Harvard, Alexander at Cornell, Andrew and Oliver. Heidi and I extend our deepest sympathy to the Adler family. Today our hearts are broken and we are devastated. What, what purpose of the gentleman from New Jersey rise? I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, for those of us who've known John for a long time and who have loved and uh, cherished him, this is a very tragic and difficult occasion. Uh, I hope that Shelley and his boys know in the depth of their grief, the breadth of love and respect for John that people feel tonight. His loss is tragic beyond words, but we can for a moment celebrate a victory over tragedy tonight, is that one person in 51 brief years could touch the lives and achieve the achievements that John Adler did in his life. His life was far too short, but it was rich, it was filled with laughter and achievement, and those of us who have been touched by his friendship count ourselves richer for the benefit of that. May God bless his family and rest his soul. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Florida rise? Without objection, the gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I rise tonight to uh, recognize the success of a local group of ninth grade students from my congressional district in South Florida, Our Lady of Lourdes Academy. Guided by their teacher, Susan Fleming, these four young ladies, Gabriela Ballesteros, Cristina Gutierrez, Lauren Lopez, and Diana Lopez, have been selected as regional winning finalists at the Toshiba National Science Teachers Association Explore a Vision competition. This group of intelligent young ladies envisioned an innovative proposal for medical technology, a surgical procedure that would treat patients whose vocal cords have been paralyzed, allowing them to speak again. Their, their groundbreaking idea was selected from over 4,000 entries and over 13,000 students. Innovative students like these four impressive girls will help lead our nation into the future, and I wish them much success in the upcoming national judging phase. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the time. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Hawaii rise? Well, she stood up. Yeah. Uh, without objection, the gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, before I talk about the bipartisan Local Taxpayer Relief Act to reauthorize the Impact Act, uh, before I go to that, I too would like to add my condolences to. Uh, the family of John Adler. John and I used to do yoga and Tai Chi together. He much more often than I at 6.30 in the morning. And I, I got to know him and, and to really admire, admire him for the commitment that he had to be of service. And the times when I would miss our Tai Chi sessions, he would say, we missed you, Maisie. We miss you, John. Impact aid. Most public school funding comes from local property taxes. However, in areas where federal property Indian lands or military bases, uh, school districts cannot collect these needed revenues. 
and without relief, taxpayers in these federally impacted areas would need to pay more to support the same level of education as other districts. The bipartisan bill that I'm introducing today would make sure that these districts would, would have the kind of federal support through impact aid that they need to ensure that all of our students, our, our children, have the kind of good education they deserve. Impact aid supports over 12 million children in more than 1,300 school districts in every single state, plus the D.C. and U.S. territories. I want to acknowledge the work of the National Association of Federally Impacted Schools, NAFIS, who worked tirelessly to bring this bill to the floor. I yield back. What purpose of the gentleman from Georgia rise? Address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today for one reason to expose the Democrats' carefully designed plan to shut down the federal government. This Friday, the short term continuing resolution expires, but the Democrats have yet to offer any real solutions for our budget mess. They just want to keep on spending, taxing, and borrowing. I believe they're dodging their responsibilities on purpose. The Democrat leadership is trying to back us into a corner with only two ways out. Keep spending money at their outrageous levels or shut down the government. We are in an economic emergency, and neither of these options will do anything for America's financial crisis. I believe they actually want to shut down the government for their own political purposes. Mr. Speaker, I implore my Democrat colleagues to do what is right for America, to get serious about cutting spending before we find ourselves so deeply mired in debt that digging out becomes impossible. I yield back. Person, for purposes, the gentleman from Washington Rice. Now, without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, we will all breathe easier if we are able to reach a bipartisan consensus about this budget impasse that we now have, but we will not all breathe easier if the Republicans succeed in essentially eliminating the ability of Uncle Sam to enforce the Clean Air Act. Now, I know it seems pretty shocking but the fact of the matter is tonight, as these discussions are going on, uh, the Republicans want to put a rider, one of these noxious viruses on the bill, a rider that would make it illegal for the Environmental Protection Agency to protect our children's health against asthma in enforcing the Clean Air Act. Now, this is pretty amazing. It cannot stand. We are encouraged that the majority leader has said they will not allow these writers. Let's get a compromise to deal with this deficit, not make it harder for our kids to breathe, not make it easier for asthma to ravage our kids, and let's preserve a bipartisan success in the Clean Air Act. So the gentleman from North Dakota, Rice. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Today I'd like to recognize the 10th anniversary of Microsoft having invested in Fargo, North Dakota. Since coming to North Dakota, Microsoft has helped create hundreds of jobs and it's increased the economic opportunity in our state. Ten years ago tomorrow, Microsoft acquired Great Plains Software in Fargo, a local homegrown company. At the time, Great Plains employed 800 people. Today, there are more than 1,500 people working in Fargo for Microsoft. And the Microsoft campus continues to grow. In fact, today, there are more than 60 open positions at Microsoft looking for people. This is what our country needs all through all, throughout all the states. I'm pleased that companies like Microsoft have felt confident in investing in our state and our people. Congratulations to Fargo Microsoft employees on your 10-year anniversary. And thank you for the positive work you've done for the Fargo community. I yield back my time. For what purpose of the gentleman from Tennessee rise? Uh, without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's on days like this in the House when you lose a colleague, uh, John Adler, who passed, uh, served in the previous Congress, that you realize 
how many good men and women come and serve in this House of Representatives and what an honor it is to serve with them and to spend time with them while they're here on this earth. But it's also a reminder on how sometimes good people pass early. So we need to all enjoy it in each day and uh, the opportunity that God has given for us to live. John Adler was a fine man. He served honorably in this Congress, and he cared about human beings. He was my friend, and I'll miss him. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What purpose of the gentleman from Colorado rise? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tonight I rise to celebrate an American family in Colorado. Steve and Angie Patterson in Denver, Colorado have three wonderful children, Cade and Marin, and tonight we pay special tribute to their son Jake celebrating his 10th birthday. They will soon be the next generation of Americans leading this country and making choices. The choices that we make in this place will impact their lives and their future. They're counting on us to do the right thing. Mr. Speaker, tonight I wish uh, that they have a very happy celebration together for the family, and we wish them their best. I yield back one time. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, too, am here to acknowledge the passing of a wonderful human being and my friend, John Adler. Congressman J John Adler served in the U House of Representatives representing a portion of our state of New Jersey. John was a hysterically funny guy, brilliant. He was a loving husband, a loving father to four outstanding young men. He was a leader in the New Jersey State Senate, recognized for his intelligence and his contribution to the people of New Jersey. I'm still in shock at his passing. It is, it, he did not deserve to die young. He was such a good man. I want to convey my thoughts and prayers to his wonderful wife, Shelley, and to their four sons, Jeffrey, Alex, Andrew, and Oliver, on the passing of this great and good and wonderful man, John Adler. What purpose does the gentleman from Illinois rise? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to congratulate a native Southern Illinoisan and a living legend in the sport of basketball, Mr. Jerry Sloan of McLeansboro, Illinois, who retired recently as head coach of the NBA's Utah Jazz. Jerry never forgot his humble roots. Throughout his playing and coaching career, he exhibited a hard work ethic, a down-to-earth demeanor, and an unassuming style. Jerry ended what was the longest tenure with the, with the same team of an active head coach in the four major sports leagues. He is third on the all-time NBA wins list with 1,221. Jerry was an outstanding athlete at McLeansboro High School, played college basketball at the University of Evansville, leading the Purple Aces to consecutive Division II national championships. He was drafted into the NBA by the Baltimore Bullets and then went to Chicago Bulls in the expansion draft. He played 10 years with the Bulls and has a num his number four jersey retired by the team. In 1979, Jerry was named head coach of the Bulls. He resigned in 1982 and joined the Jazz as an assistant coach in 1984. He became the Jazz head coach in 1988. Jerry led the Jazz to the NBA Finals twice. He was inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame in 2009. Jerry is a gracious, honest, tractor-loving guy. He will be missed in Utah, but those of us in Southern Illinois will welcome the chance to see him more often. And I yield back the balance of my time. What, for what purpose does the gentleman from Vermont rise? Address the House for one minute and revise Ms. Penn. Uh, without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Uh, uh, John Adler was in the class just uh, after me, and I got to know him well uh, because the freshman and sophomore classes uh, went through learning how to serve in this Congress together. I also got to know him uh, because we happened to have our lockers in the same uh, section of the gym. And I'm stunned as we all are, but what was so amazing to me in my getting to know John Adler was I learned about his Harvard education, the college and the law school. I had some 
assumptions about him that he had a much more uh, prosperous early life than he did. He had to earn everything that he got. I also learned about the challenges that he faced and what was clear to me, as it was to all of us who got to know him, is that he was a person who made a decision that whatever the challenge, he was going to face it with good humor, uh, with optimism, uh, with a sense of doing the work because it was worth doing for and in and of itself. I also remember many times asking him about his weekend and what he always responded with was something about his family. It wasn't about the speech he gave, it wasn't about the press release or a paper, a story in the paper or on TV. It was always, every single time, about his family. John Adler uh, was a good friend. He will be missed. A wonderful, wonderful servant in Congress. I yield back. Is there any more requests for one minute special orders? Not seeing none. Okay. The chair lays before the House the following personal request. Leaves of absence requested for Mrs. Black of Tennessee for today. Mr. Freelingheisen of New Jersey for today through Wednesday, April 6th, Mr. Poe of Texas for today, and Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas for today. Without objection, the requests are granted. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5th, 2011, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingry, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, thank you uh, very much, and, and uh, what, what we're going to do here for the next hour uh, is talk about uh, why we feel so strongly uh, the need to repeal, and if not successful, uh, to defund uh, so many provisions of, of Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. But, Mr. Speaker, before I, I get started in, in the subject uh, at hand, I do want to join uh, my colleagues, uh, particularly my colleagues on the Democratic side of the aisle, uh, in remembering uh, our, our colleague John Adler. Uh, I didn't realize that, that John had been sick. I didn't realize that John had had surgery. I didn't realize until just moments ago that our colleague from New Jersey uh, had died. Uh, and as I uh, sat here listening to the New Jersey uh, delegation uh, on both sides of the aisle uh, talk about John, and it, it helped me understand a little bit better about him. And uh, all I know about John is that he was a great guy and a, a really, really nice member of this body and someone that I respected and I got to know him, Mr. Speaker, uh, in the House gym uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning usually. Uh, he would be working out and I'd be working out. I'm 15 years older than, than John was and uh, we just uh, struck up a good friendship and I truly will miss him as well as uh, uh, my other colleagues as they express their sympathy to his wife and his four sons. But truly a great member. And it reminds me too, Mr. Speaker, that as we do our work, uh, as we do our work with one minute and we do our work with five minutes special orders and, and now this uh, leadership hour talking about, about a very important issue uh, that our, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, for the most part, almost 100 percent of them feel very differently uh, about th this issue. We, we differ on a lot of things and we'll continue to do that. It's gone on forever. But the point I would like to make, uh, and, and I'll conclude with this, is that there are 435 people uh, in this House of Representatives. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we Republicans are in the majority and sometimes the Democrats are in the majority and the worm turns and nothing is forever. Uh, but we have good, decent men and women serving here, representing their districts and doing the work of the people. Uh, and God bless them. God bless each and every one of them. God bless a member like John Adler, uh, who died much too young, as my colleagues have said already. But uh, uh, we want to always keep in mind that as we argue and debate and make points and feel very strongly about an issue, uh, that doesn't mean we don't love one another. And we do. And I love John Adler. He was a a great member of this body. Uh, 
Mr. Speaker, I, I, again, I, I, here we are, though, getting right back into the business uh, at hand, and this is a, a hugely important week, a hugely important week, uh, as we try to come to some conclusion in regard to how much money we need to cut uh, out of not this year's, uh, this fiscal year we're in right now, uh, but the last fiscal year, which started, uh, well, actually, we're in the fiscal year, but it started on October the 1st of 2010, and here we are, what is it, the 4th of April, uh, 2011? So half of the fiscal year has uh, uh, already uh, expired, uh, and we have not funded the government except in this piecemeal fashion. We didn't have a budget, we didn't have spending bills, and we'll put these little two-week band-aids, uh, two, three weeks, uh, a little bit of cutting, but uh, from my perspective and from my side of the aisle and our leadership, uh, not nearly, nearly enough. Uh, and, and, you know, we're faced with this uh, a tremendous uh, issue of uh, w w trying to reach a compromise and an agreement uh, to, to lower spending. Uh, and the American people certainly uh, gave a mandate, I think, to 87 uh, new Republicans and, and nine new Democrats to, you know, come up here and, and, and quit all this spending. Uh, let's not have $1.5 trillion deficits uh, year after year after year. That's how you get to $14 trillion worth of debt. Uh, and that's what we're facing right now. And indeed, in a, in a month or so, uh, we're going to be asked to even raise that debt ceiling statutorily to say, well, we'll, we'll continue to borrow and kick the can down the road. Uh, so obviously, Mr. Speaker, these are times that try men and women's souls, uh, and we all feel very strongly about our position. Uh, but I know my leadership uh, and members on this side of the aisle, and I hope our colleagues, our Democratic colleagues, feel the same way. We hope and pray that we can do the people's work and cut this spending uh, and get this country back on a sound uh, fiscal uh, uh, footing uh, so that as we go forward with the 20, two, uh, 2012 budget, uh, which we'll hear uh, about tomorrow, uh, that we will continue to work hard to finally balance this budget and get our country out of this significant debt. Uh, speaking of debt, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, the reason I'm, I'm here tonight, and I, I, I represent uh, the, the caucus uh, on the Republican side of the aisle known as the House GOP Doctors Caucus. Uh, there are, I think, 21 of us now, uh, doctors and nurses, uh, on this side of the aisle with ye just years and years uh, of clinical experience. As an e example, uh, I spent 26 years practicing my specialty of obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, we have registered nurses that are part of the doctor's caucus. Uh, we have uh, specialist general surgeons, uh, cardiothoracic surgeons, uh, family practitioners, gastroenterologists, uh, I could go on and on, but some of them hopefully will, will be with me uh, during this hour, will join me in a few minutes to talk a little bit more about our concerns, their concerns, Mr. Speaker, uh, with the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. This was a, a, a bill, a law that was finally passed and signed by President Obama on March the 23rd, 2010, uh, after about a year and a half of debating the issue on both uh, in this chamber and in the Senate chamber, uh, and when it finally came down to uh, the reality that uh, there weren't enough votes uh, on the Senate side, uh, it was passed by something called reconciliation, which to this day I don't think the American people understand. But, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you this. What they do understand is they don't like it. They didn't like the process, uh, and they don't like the policy. Now, I have heard the president say, uh, and I have, I've heard uh, the Democratic leadership uh, in the 111th Congress uh, when this bill was passed uh, talk about how uh, Congress, and particularly the Democratic members, have been trying to pass 
uh, a comprehensive, massive health care reform law for almost a hundred years. Uh, they, they talked about uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and they talked about John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and they talked about, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, President Bill Clinton in uh, and, and saying, you know, we, we finally got there. We finally did it. We finally accomplished what we've been trying to do for almost 100 years. Well, they missed the point, Mr. Speaker, because the reason why that uh, that type of legislation uh, was not passed in a hundred years is because the American people back then didn't want it uh, any more than they do today. Uh, and some 62 percent uh, still say very loudly and very clearly in poll after poll after poll, we don't want the federal government taking over health care. One-sixth of our economy, lock, stock, and barrel, we don't want that. We want improvement in our health care. Uh, in, in, no matter how good something might be, there's always room for improvement. And clearly, our health care system is too expensive. We agree with that. Uh, I think members on both sides of the aisle can uh, reach that conclusion uh, pretty clearly. So there's agreement uh, to try to do everything we can to continue to provide the best health care in the world. It's not true when people say our health care system is like that of a third world country. Nothing could be further from the truth. We have the greatest health care system in the world. Uh, and some of the doctors in the uh, House GOP caucus will be with me tonight to talk about that. Uh, so, you know, the old expression, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think that's what we have, we have tended to do here. We've, we've enacted into law on March 23rd of last year. Uh, it's already had its one-year anniversary uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we, have, we have done something that I think that is not only opposed to the, what the American people want. You should never do that. But it's bad. It's bad medicine. Uh, it's bad for consumers. It's bad for patients. It's certainly bad for corporate America. And it's absolutely bad for the taxpayer. Uh, and it's a top-down sort of system where a bureaucracy comes between, literally and figuratively, a doctor and his or her patient. That's not a prescription for improving our health care system. I've got <laughs> a couple of posters uh, here with me, and I wanted to reference these to my colleagues. Uh, in fact, I'll have several more, but I'm going to keep this one up on my uh, uh, far left. Uh, that one that shows the picture, I forget what his name was. Maybe one of my colleagues will remember. Well, I remember uh, Boss Hogg. But I was trying to remember what the actor's name was. I don't think he's still living, but uh, I think most of my colleagues do remember Boss Hogg from uh, that old uh, series, uh, The Dukes of Hazard was one of my favorites, uh, kind of like uh, poking fun at ourselves, really, uh, sort of like Archie Bunker and All in the Family and things like that that we can, those of us who've been around a while can look back on and laugh and get a chuckle out of it. But... Uh, boss Hogg sort of represents uh, the boss, the, 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 the bureaucracy, if you will, uh, of the, the government, big government, running, running health care. And under old Boss Hogg's picture, there he is with that cigar in his hand, you can have whatever you like as long as the boss approves it. Uh, and that's really the way it has turned out. When we talked about in the House, I think it was uh, uh, H.R. House of Representatives Bill Number 3200. Uh, it was uh, Senate uh, Bill 3590, or, or H.R. Uh, 3590, a shell bill that came over from the Senate that finally was passed into law and became known as Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. But that 
that law has so much bureaucracy, and I'll get into some of the numbers on that in regard to uh, all of the new uh, 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 folks in the government that would control health care, but all under uh, this, this giant uh, government takeover, uh, and, and Boss Hogg sort of represents that to me as a way of, 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 of communicating with the public. Uh, but in any regard, I, I, before I continue with some of the statistics uh, on the bill, I see that I'm joined by my colleague from, from Georgia, a fellow physician and a member of the House GOP caucus who is a family practice physician uh, from uh, the Athens uh, area uh, where the great University of Georgia is located. Uh, Dr. Paul Brown is actually a doctor who makes house calls, which is really unique and refreshing. Uh, and he's been a welcome addition to not only our Georgia delegation, but this, uh, this body. And I'm proud at this time to yield time to the gentleman uh, from uh, Athens and Augusta and my hometown, uh, Dr. Paul Brown. Thank you, Dr. Gingrey. I appreciate you yielding me some time. Uh, Dr. Gingrey, I have... Uh,